Mm -hmm. Nice. So happy, Marcus, to, to see you again after one year, more or less. Yes. <laughs> so happy. I'm also very excited. I'm following your, your uh, documents in the mm -hmm. internet, your web page. Um, this uh, document for me opened a new door in uh, after 15 years teaching uh, Prolog, opened a new door to access to exercises that before was almost impossible to solve, like Sudoku or one of the similar exercises that I had many problems with uh, trying to use codes and never, at the end, never, never worked good. And with your, your implementation, we did this year with my students, so great, so smart, so efficient. Um, I'm following your material and I want to improve to, to go ahead and see more exercises in the future. So, so happy. This so is happy. like, I don't know, um, a new door to knowledge, <laughs> thanks to your web page. <laughs> Great. Uh, I mean, this is really nice to hear. And I'm, I'm so glad that you find this interesting and also your students find it useful. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm extremely pleased uh, that you can use this. And um, I mean, it's also great, of course, that you all have uh, such a dedicated teacher. I mean, this is also, this is uh, not not um, normal even and uh, quite unusual, in fact, so that you are really on the edge also on the things that are now uh, getting interesting. So these yeah. are exciting times because also the first time that now uh, free product implementations are becoming so uh, available even. I mean, this is un this is highly unusual. I mean, for uh, in the 80s, for example, the first product systems, uh, you could buy them for tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and even also today that the commercial systems uh, cost tens of, of thousands of dollars and, and they, they have no problem selling it at that cost. So uh, mm -hmm. There is a market uh, for that, and uh, but uh, now for the first time, also due to the internet, uh, the free implementations, and also due to better implementation techniques, and also maybe interest from uh, more uh, people, and also new programming languages, of course, that um, are maybe more, um, uh, maybe faster to implement product systems. I mean, it's uh, you must, uh, I mean, you must also take into account implementing a product system. It takes 20 years easily. So the systems we are now seeing, they have all been under development for uh, 25 years at least. Mm -hmm. So this is especially maybe for, for students interesting because uh, I mean, probably at now at 20 or 25, it's hard to imagine that someone has started working on the systems uh, before you were born even, and they are now even now still progressing and uh, getting better. Uh, so this is a completely new, maybe also phenomenon that uh, things that uh, take so long. Okay. Um, I want to tell to my students, if they, they want to make any question, you can, you can do, don't worry, probably. I have some question I have to, I want to, to ask to Marcus, but if you have any question, please don't hesitate to, to, to make your, your question. Marcus, I want to, to, um, to uh, make a question to you, like, uh, do you think we are on an, an a different point, a new starting point in artific artificial intelligence, thanks to this new way to program, like constraint uh, logic, um, this constraint logic programming? Do you think we are we are in a, a special point in the history of artificial intelligence? Do you think that will open new doors to resolve more problems than before or? Interesting. I mean, uh, a highly interesting question. Uh, I think uh, personally, I think, yes, in a sense, we are, we are in a new place now, even though many methods that are now um, come, becoming available were already known for, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, they are now becoming feasible because we have uh, better, um, certainly, certainly better hardware. But not only that, uh, we have this, I mean, it sounds ridiculous almost to say it, but we have now the internet, which wasn't available in the 80s, 
so that so much interest also so so much publicity i mean also in the 80s certainly there was a lot of publicity but now you have uh, the opportunity to reach uh, to really reach the best uh, programmers and most interested mathematicians uh, and implementers uh, most dedicated people also to work in this area which i think is is highly unusual that that it becomes at the same time first so decentralized that you, i mean a single person can nowadays start an entire um, currency which is then used worldwide uh, completely unheard of um but all, but in a sense also becoming so highly centralized that maybe one two companies or organizations can can summon uh, implementers from all over the planet uh, to work to work on one specific area for example with almost unlimited funding so i think both situations that we have this extreme centralization and also uh, being able at the same time to reach the into the farthest um farthest areas of the world to gather interest in this top in these topics uh, is both uh, extremely unusual and uh, unheard of and unprecedented uh, so uh, previously i mean um to to work to work on the cutting edge uh, you have to be at a university almost or maybe find some highly specialized um, areas where you could apply this which were much harder to find now it's quite easy to find people who are working on this uh, apply or show uh, the work you can do and immediately almost uh, work in that area which i think is unprecedented and, and i think this is one reason also uh, why we see um uh, so uh, such extremely unusual uh, developments suddenly because you have, uh, I mean, there's some competition, um, uh, some team wins the competition with some approach and the next day the entire world knows it, uh, everyone in that area knows it and can apply it, can uh, build on this. So, um, I mean, if you also look at the product systems that are now becoming available and the free systems, especially uh, contributors from all over the world uh, can work on them. And it's um, it's almost normal to get a, a different pool request on GitHub from a different continents uh, all the time. So I think this is extremely unusual, uh, unprecedented. So, I mean, in, in, the, in the 80s, uh, certainly the fifth generation computer science systems project um, also was so ambitious and also attracted a lot of interest and also attracted these experts, um, but lacked these, these international uh, connections that you could immediately work uh, from anywhere in the world uh, on these projects and contribute. And this is now the, the normal situation. So... Um, okay. And, and, and also, I think one, one thing also, I mean, the, the problems are also... the the problems are becoming harder simply. I mean, uh, we need, I think, also the, the consciousness that we need simply better tools also, better languages, better ways to implement software is also becoming increasingly obvious because we have also so, so now so many legacy systems, which is also unprecedented. I mean, uh, almost tautologically, it's unprecedented that we have such a long history of legacy systems in banks, in airlines, in the government sector, uh, in legal tech. Uh, so we have all these legacy systems also now, uh, and we need to, um, to mean to really um, continue working in these areas or keeping these uh, all these sectors working. I think it's clear that we need uh, better mechanisms to to develop software. Yeah. In this sense. In this sense, um, neural networks are deeply used in the industrial um, um, mm -hmm. education and research. But you know, uh, neural networks have, have the problem: you don't have a way to know um, how it's like a black box system mm -hmm. where you train the net. At the end, you obtain good results at this at this point but you don't have a way to to know exactly what is happening inside this black box and um system like prolog with logic can give an in, intelli artificial intelligence uh, with the opportunity to change change this model easily for example i find that your implementation of this uh, is, um, timetable for the school. Mm -hmm. I find this so great, 
so efficient. You can schedule a big uh, 16. I think your example you have, your third yes. sample is 16 plus. I, I had, um, I was secretary in my department. I had to organize this uh, classroom. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. It takes a lot of time yeah. to make an organization with uh, um, taking into account this conflict with this uh, ten, the um, availability of the teacher professors. Mm -hmm. It's very hard and you get the system in only less than one second, you organize everything. With all yeah. the restrictions that you want, it's very easy to add new restrictions. Mm -hmm. It's simple if you if you know how the, the system works, it's very easy to add, add your own restriction in your system. It's very easy to modify. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think that um, way to implement with uh, constraint logic programming. Um, in which sense it would be better than neural networks? Um, mm -hmm. In this sense of mm -hmm. what give more? Yes. Um, I mean, first of all, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, task. This uh, also me personally, I was extremely attracted to school timetabling, even at school or already. So this is one thing that also attracted me because I, as a, as a uh, pupil, I always always wondered how do they create these timetables. I mean, also at our school, there was one single person. So your yeah. analogon um, at um, in Austria uh, did this also manually. Um, I always wondered how did uh, did this and for me it was a revelation to see that this can also be easily done with with constraints and i think here it's pretty clear that uh, that um there is uh there is nothing uh, to guess but the constraints are already known so you know that some teachers have this preference you, you know already because they tell you they can they tell you i want to have uh wednesday free always because in, in our school for example they could choose one day in a week where there would be no schedules uh, no uh, lessons scheduled on that uh, specific day so you know this in advance so there is nothing here that um you don't have to to go through the effort to learn this from existing data, for example. So it would be kind of um, pointless to go uh, to train, for example, a, neur a neural network um, to find out that one um, one of the teachers has this preference or wants this day uh, free. It could also be different this year, for example, than other years. Um, and it's pointless to go through the data to conclude this uh, because you can easily ask the person. You can easily yeah. go to, to the teacher and ask which day do you want free and tr then try to find a schedule that uh, that has that satisfies all these requirements so this is i think a clear case where the where, where the um, constraints are known and need not be guessed and this is one example of of such a case there are many other such cases where we don't need to guess the laws from the data because the laws are already available so for example in legal tech or in uh, tax uh, law or in government applications, you can simply go through the laws and you know what rules must be satisfied. You know, for example, there is no no question or no need to deduce how a tax could be computed uh, from some data. So and don't need to train a network, for example, to guess what percentages uh, maybe have to be given to the to the government because this is a tax on something. I know these rules. I, I mean, maybe I don't. I don't know them, but I, I can look them up. They are written in law and them. Uh, and I mean, in, especially in government applications, there's a clear law even that the, um, the administration can act only insofar as the law grants it. So the the, um, the administration cannot act arbitrarily, but must also uphold all these laws because the, um, the administ administrative acts must be computable in a sense or must be um, traceable. So these are clear applications, I think, where it's more interesting and more important to think about how can we convert these existing known rules into programs right. that can run automatically. And there, I mean, this is also not unusual. This happens all the time, also in government applications. Every time you log in into a government system, there is some something that happens automatically. And uh, if you have, uh, for example, um, 
uh, a tax um, application or a tax filing, there is some computer program that maybe makes some uh, checks or assessments. This all already happens, but it's maybe not as elegant currently as it could be and not as transparent as it could be if these rules, for example, were written in a more readable, more easily verifiable way. So for me, the one critical aspect of, of Prolog is that you can really also reason about the, the programs themselves. So you can simply read the, the entire programs, make some checks, make forms, for example, type checks, or interpret them in different ways uh, maybe try to find out whether they are uh, they correspond to something from previous years and so on. So, so this is one I think a, a quite clear example where you don't have to guess anything. It's all known. The, the task is only how can we automate um, the things we we want to hold. And it's it's very easy to to modify the model. Um, Mm -hmm. Relating some rules, adding some new rules or new logic. Not only rule, yeah. but you need, need to implement a new simple predicate to modify the model. It's very yeah. simple. If you have a, a neural network, you have to train again with uh, probably, if, I don't know, probably you, you have to change totally the model. But in this way, um, you have this logic easily underst understandable for, for a human, no? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so, so interesting. Um, can you talk, um, you to tell me you have an, a new project with oncology? Yes, yes, yes. This can is you one tell also. us a yes. little bit about that? <laughs> yes, certainly. So uh, this is also this is also quite recent for, for me. There is, um, there's one oncologist, so a clinical oncologist. Uh, he uh, is a has a medical degree and also a mathematician. So he has also a mathematics degree. I post his home page in the chat. It's uh, Precision Methods uh, Guru. I hope you can read this. He, this is um, David C. Norris. And uh, so this looks uh, quite tough. He has uh, lots of uh, papers also and, and publications about um, his approach. Also some, some videos, if you find them interesting. But so there are several things here to, to mention or to read. But one thing I would like to mention specifically in this area is uh, a new package he's currently, in fact, uh, working on um, called Precautionary. And... Let's. Uh, I, I post. Uh, I send you this GitHub uh, link mm -hmm. because this is really work in progress and uh, uses, in fact, also new features that are now just now becoming available in Scribe.org. For example, to make this more efficient, I post you. I send you here the link also in the chat. This precautionary package. Um, precautionary. Mm -hmm. And specifically, and this is the bleeding edge branch now, uh, this is the third link I post, this Boeing CPE. And now we are really at the heart of the matter. This uh, CPE stands for complete path enumeration. And the, the use case is this. When you um, you are in, in um, drug design, this is, uh, for example, in uh, chemo uh, or in some therapeutic methods when you have cancer, you get uh, some some medicine, and the the point of this medicine is to try to kill the cancer, mm -hmm. and for this you have to uh, to use as highest dose as the patient can tolerate. So this is the maximum tolerable dose, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then it's uh, it's toxic. So uh, if you go beyond that dose, it would be toxic to the patient and maybe even kill the patient or have some uh, very severe side effects. So you, you can't go beyond a certain threshold because then it's too toxic, but you must, uh, you must um, uh, titrate, has, uh, titrate it right to the limit that the patient uh, can still uh, bear. And, uh, and, and how do you find this dose? I mean, it's, uh, if you have only one patient, it's in a sense straightforward. You just give more and more medicine, but if you do it in that way, it can also have adverse side effects because there, the patient, uh, for example, develops some tolerance if you start with uh, small doses. So you ideally also have to start with the highest dose that can be tolerated, but there is, it's hard to guess. So here statistics enter, of course. So there are some clinical trial designs where they find out or try to find out which 
doses can usually be tolerated at most. And uh, this thinking in itself, this statistical uh, thinking also has uh, comes with uh, problems and caveats, of course. But the, the point is that to find out these doses, because the, uh, the pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical uh, um, company cannot simply sell the medicine and tell the, med uh, tell the physicist, just try it out and just uh, go higher and higher. They mm -hmm. must specify some initial dose, for example. So it will all must mm -hmm. have some basis in some trials, for example. And in these trials, so you have, for example, 100 patients, and there are now various methods in which you could uh, could try to uh, detect or find out or reason about what the maximum dose is that can be tolerated. And this works like this. You, without going even with the caveat that I'm, I'm not a physicist, I'm also certainly not an oncologist, but what I understand from these trials, as far as I uh, know currently, is that um, this, there are various trial designs in which you could approach this task. But one um, commonly applied method is the so-called 3 plus 3 design, where you enroll three patients at some dose, in the initial dose, so level one, so to say, mm -hmm. and then try it out. And if they can all tolerate it, then you forget these three, you enroll the next three and you go higher, you go one higher. And then there are various possibilities. So for example, one can no longer tolerate it, then you forget these three and enroll another three uh, with the same dose. Then if they can all tolerate it, you can increase it. If you have, again, one severe side effect, you must stop at it those. So the, the exact details uh, depend on the trial design, but the point is to get some feeling or some idea of what the, the maximum tolerable dose is for this specific medicine or drug. And, and now the point. The point is that you can make several statements about the trial design itself without even applying it, without even uh, running one specific instance. You can analyze the trial as a whole and say, for example, is this a good way to um, find out the maximum tolerable dose? Is this a good way in itself? Or would it, for example, not be better to enroll maybe four patients or maybe two patients and then make some different uh, things. And this is the point of the um, uh, of David Norris's uh, current work to apply Prolog to the trial design itself. So to formulate the trial design in a declarative way to so that you can, first of all, run it, apply it in individual cases, but also reason about the trial design itself and ask, for example, to, and this is complete path, path enumeration, to generate all possible trials that can occur as a result of this specification. And this is where Apollo comes in because he describes the, the essence or the, the, the rules that are applied uh, depending on what happens, depending on whether you have, for example, uh, zero adverse effects or one or two, then you either stay or escalate or de-escalate. So the, and the point would be, of course, to unify all these possible trial designs themselves via this formal mechanism so that you can use Prolog or this domain-specific language he, he is working on to say something then about the, this trial design. And I think this is a, an extremely interesting um, task, first of all, because it clearly has some uh, health benefits and it's in fact applied also uh, currently and can also maybe ensure safety properties or help us to automatically determine safety properties of these trials themselves so that you can say something say make some statement for example where we have generated all we have looked at all possible um, trials that can arise all possible concrete uh, things that can happen at for example a drug that has six different dose levels and we have concluded that something never arises. Some uh, case where, for example, there is some redundancy in the trial design so that you could, for example, avoid uh, that too many patients uh, get an overdose. Um, so this is, yeah, but this is just now beginning. So this is work um, I've also for only for a few months cooperated uh, with uh, David and, and I helped in, in some ways, in some small ways as uh, David is, um, working on this and I, I, for example, my task here is to find out if CLPZ, so this constraint solver over integers, uh, maybe can be improved in some ways if um, David mentions that there are some cases where he sees that it's slow, uh, so I can look at them at the code and think, okay, maybe I can uh, make it faster for some use cases, so this is my, my small contribution 
to, to, to this work. Um, yeah, but, but this is some, something I hope also your students uh, find interesting as some concrete application and very recent application of new methods, also of new constructs that are now becoming available for the first time uh, in Scryer Prolog. Um, and it could be very interesting, certainly if some of you are interested then also to continue maybe in uh, bioinformatics or um, oncology or uh, medical designs. Uh, this could be also maybe an interesting um, practice project. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure if you understood everything. <laughs> I'm not sure, but um, would it be possible in this model, for example, including information about, for example, the age of the person that have this uh, intolerant? You have you can include to the model information about yes. the age or or the weight or um, if you have previous, for example, as a uh, habit like never do a sport or, or something like that, you can include some type, this type of yes. in, in rules to the system to, to add information? Yes. I mean, uh, this is one uh, now also already the, the, another interesting question. The, there are also, and, and I just must mention advice, uh, me medical advice, but um, as far as I understand it, also in the medical community, uh, you, have, uh, you have oncologists who argue that you must really treat each individual specifically because each of them has a specific condition or a specific age, of course, a specific uh, situation, hobbies and so on. And you must, for example, some would uh, probably argue that you cannot apply this statistical reasoning because the patients are all different. And even if you have, for example, um, a thousand people who can tolerate the, uh, the drug at this level, maybe then your concrete patient still has an overdose or still doesn't tolerate it at that uh, level. So you must, uh, they would uh, likely argue, you must really apply uh, your, your attention to this specific patient and go into all these uh, details. And certainly there, there this, all these factors come into play then. So one point of all this work is also to uh, find ways in which uh, it's easy to see uh, or prove certain properties where one can then show a weakness, for example, in this approach, in this 3 plus 3 design, which I mentioned. So uh, this would certainly be an interesting result and, and useful result to say, if you do it this way to determine uh, um, maximum tolerable dose, for example, um, then you run the risk of something uh, or with some probability, for example, to overdose patients then you, that you then treat. But the point here is to just to start from somewhere so that uh, more and more can be automated. Because what you now, what what's now the situation also in the medical community is there are some textual descriptions of how these trials work. So the the trial uh, practitioners they get these textual descriptions, and in the description it states. You must escalate, you must de-escalate, you must enroll new patients, uh, you must um, stay at this level. And this is all prone to mistakes and also interpretation mistakes because the clinician who, who really applies uh, this or tries to um, tries to act according to the description may misread the statement because there's maybe some small footnote that says if you already if you had uh, one case where you already de-escalated then don't de-escalate again and so some maybe exception to some to something and it's currently quite hard also for the clinicians to make absolutely certain that they follow the the design as it was actually planned or actually um actually intended mm -hmm. so one uh, one one key contribution here also for, uh, by david is to formalize all these currently informal descriptions as a prolog uh, program as rules that can be automatically applied so that one can show another uh, clinician these are the rules are they okay and if if all of them agree and all the, the a significant part agrees and says this is the rule or uh, unless anyone can or they cannot point to anything that where they say this is not what we actually intended with the design then you can you can run it automatically because these rules are machine interpretable and the computer can execute them 
and uh, then you have removed at least this problem where a different clinician interprets the rules in a different way because then it's it's clear from the description what must be done at each step and if not then certainly david's work should also point this out find it out for example here is some ambiguity this is also another important uh, contribution because from this declarative description that david is uh, currently working on you could uh, with a pollock program analyze all these cases and find out for example that uh, in some situations two different branches two different procedures would apply because they are not uh, mutually exclusive or they they can um, they can both uh, could both be um, a- applicable it would be of course also an interesting and and useful contribution to either find su- out such a problem in the specification or Uh, on the other hand, to guarantee or make this strong uh, safety property that this um, does not occur. I want I want to show you one idea related to this this question. My father, uh, he he had a cancer. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, yeah, he he died in in 2015, at the end of of. 2015, um, um, my brother, he dedicated his life to mm. try to study um, uh, another way to apply med- medicine, like uh, mm-hmm. Chinese medicine, yes. other concepts. And there, um, a doctor, I don't remember the, the name now, but I can, I can give you the book because he have an idea. Mm-hmm. about the, ca- the cancer, I think it's very interesting. This yes. approach is very, for me, it's very different approach. Like he said that immunitary system is a question not only for one individual, it's a question for a group. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting to, to think about immunitary system is outside or not exactly outside us, It depends on, on the group. For example, is he said that cancer um, comes to resolve some questions. Mm. Like, for example, he said that um, this person is, is a very hard idea. Okay, <laughs> I know that it will be very hard for one person that have this this cancer. This person, in a certain way are not um, given the opportunity to people in the group to go up. It's like someone that have a lot of power mm. are not given the opportunity to grow up, to go up, to, mm. to develop themselves, other, other people in the group, no? Um, this, uh, in this sense, it's very particular idea. I know it's probably, it's, it's not possible to apply this idea in any case, But for me, it's interesting to try to f- uh, find if these uh, type of elements mm-hmm. will appear frequently yes. in this person. Like yes. people, for, for example, in case of my father, my father had, um, um, for him, it was very, very difficult to delegate tasks to other people. Mm-hmm. It was very hard to delegate tasks. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Probably he's uh, something like, I don't know. Um, he's, uh, I don't know, some, something will be interesting to explore. Yes, I, yes. I, I, mm-hmm. uh, certainly, I mean, uh, this is all, uh, David is a strong proponent also uh, of this patient uh, centricity. So all this work is also meant uh, to, to find really um, weaknesses of this, uh, of this statistical approach. Uh, so... Um, Where, where you where, where you where you treat all these patients uh, the same so this is uh, the, the goal is certainly also this individualization where you can then make um, take into account more that's specific to that person uh, yeah but i mean I just first uh, david is is not present and i um, i'm not a medical uh, specialist so this is o- o- only the the prolog part that i 
understand and then uh, that I try to help and uh, just I posted it if you are interested uh, from an from from an application of Prolog uh, perspective maybe um, you one of your students uh, is interested in this and uh, this is certainly the prospect I mean this is certainly in the right area if you want to um, go into this direction in the medical direction uh, there are many many other possible applications yeah. certainly um, also in oncology, for example, uh, the, this also what you mentioned, the, uh, maybe going through the, the literature of existing results or, for example, of these combinations of approaches that were already tried maybe in specific situations, these oncologists, they have their databases, but they are not easily accessible for the oncologists themselves because the oncologists usually are not prolog experts, for example, or cannot uh, write, for example, their own analysis um, of, these, of this huge body of literature. So you can, if you're interested in this work, would be also an interesting project to simply uh, go into, the, the, there is some way, somewhere where you can download, I think, a, a 700 megabyte file of, uh, of, for example, um, documents of uh, drugs that were already tested in combination, also with some other attributes added. Uh, and it would be an interesting self-contained project in itself to Right, for example, uh, a prolog, a parser, and prolog was designed for parsing. So this was really um, would be ideal to find out such connections, maybe starting from somewhere, starting from from these drugs, and then certainly, as you say, uh, find out more connections. Maybe by intelligently pr uh, processing the data would be uh, a great uh, contribution. I hope uh, helps also in in the future, certainly for for patients. Uh, uh, yeah, I, so again. I remember the, the name of this doctor. The name is David Lujan. I, I write in the chat. He had these interesting books because he had many out of experience in um, Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. in India, many places. And he developed this strange idea of, of uh, immunology, in, in, um, immunology system in, mm -hmm. in the sense of group instead of the sense of individual. I don't know. I don't know. I, there are many yeah. things, there are many it, people who say that yeah. in habits in life can yes. improve. Probably if the cancer is very extended in the body, yes. you need the help of the, I don't know, chemical things or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, but at the totally. same time, you can do in, in, in attack this in the in different ways. Yes, that's certainly. Uh, that's uh, certainly. Uh, this is really also. David mentioned this uh, repeatedly. Also to me, this is a, a multifaceted uh, disease with with several uh, factors. Also a metabolic component for so it depends highly also on the patient. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so so this is one one uh, application that that I briefly mentioned and uh, I pasted these links. And if you're interested, uh, I hope uh, one of your students also your yeah yeah you, um, and thank you for this link. Ah yeah, now I see also the the what you pasted. Thank you. I'm gonna um, for me at this point. I want to first it's in this first uh, first uh, step. I want to to go ahead uh, with your exercises. Try to mm -hmm. understand or. You, you way to program. I think it's very, mm -hmm. very interesting. I want to to analyze your code, <laughs> try to understand how you, you program because I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's so great way. Uh, for example, my next point is to try to understand the this timetable uh, organized mm -hmm. uh, software because I realize that is that will be very interesting not only to um, this uh, program will be interesting not only to organize the classroom. You think about you ha you are in a department, and you 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 uh, need to know how many professors you have to contract. Yes. Um, or how many classrooms you need for yes. your uh, school, or if, yes. if you have enough classroom or not. Yes. In in uh, using your professor. It's very easy to change the constraint and, and make some tests. Okay, what happens if if I only have a professor that can teach in the morning? Or what happens if I uh, have I put a new classroom or 
or probably I can teach the same subject in only five rooms in not in seven. I don't know. You can organize, yes. not only planify the in one direction, you can give a lot of information using this like a test um, a test platform to get new information. It's be very easy. I probably it is possible to do the same with this cancer approach. I don't know to to know um, we know that probably have two directions. Not only you give the input, uh, obtain the output, and here is you have the problem, you you can get the solution, but probably you can have different uh, variations in your problem to give information and to, to take decisions about what to do. It's very easy to organize, planify everything in your classroom with uh, testing some restriction and see what happened. Yes, um, I can't, uh, I, I noticed that I cannot share my screen here. Uh, this is uh, disabled, but, but one thing that also, um, Maybe interesting because this what you mentioned uh, to find out maybe which constraint also is responsible for the failure. Uh, this is also very easy in Prolog and also one key attraction of Prolog that you can uh, simply remove goals and yeah. obtain a generalization. So this way you can and in in Scryer Prolog for example you have Larry debug where you can simply you don't have to comment out anything. You can simply insert an, an asterisk. Um, and then the goal is generalized away. And if you know, the, if you then try it, uh, if you generalize uh, away a goal and run the program again, the query, if it then, um, is, uh, if it then um, still fails, then you know uh, this constraint was not responsible for the failure or could have been responsible, but uh, you know that, that um, some other constraint still is too tight. Uh, so you, you must... Uh, maybe uh, try a further Change. generalization and uh, try to to really pinpoint which fragments uh, still cause failure. Then you know that um, yeah. So you can debug uh, debug the program in a way that um, maybe fits very nicely with this thinking about what um, still holds if this uh, is the case or not uh, no longer the case. So this is also quite unique to Polog. So there, there is no other programming language where you can, for example, simply uh, remove a few lines um, and then try it because it doesn't the, work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even. Yeah, it doesn't work. Doesn't compile. Yeah. But in Prolog, you can do this, which is highly unusual. Yeah, yeah. For me, see, for I there are some exercises with it. I have no idea how to resolve in other programming language. Really, I yes. don't know. Probably. For example, we analyzed the the Sudoku in the 99 proc problems. You know this. You know this this in this mm -hmm. page. Yes. The the solution in this 99 proc problem of Sudoku have have 230 36 lines with codes. Yes. Very very complicated to understand. <laughs> Your implementation are probably I yeah. don't know three lines in. The first part and the second second yes. um, predicate another three. Very ins simple. It's not only like describe what a Sudoku means. It's only that. So you are only like yes. des describing what, what means a Sudoku. Yes. Very easy to change the rules and, and create a new game, different game. Only yeah. changing some some rule. It's so smart, clever, and so efficient. No, it is for me is a surprise how efficient is this uh, methodology for me it's a me only a, it's a methodology how to to organize the information like as integer mm -hmm. and use constraints because they have both uh, you have to represent this problem with integers yes and then use this uh, constraint like your or how you resolve the, your puzzles like with integers um, this uh, zebra puzzle is a very interesting yeah. problem too yeah, this is a great fit, certainly. So uh, these combinatorial tasks are great fits uh, for the constraint solver. And this is really works out in practice uh, very nicely. And um, also it's interesting because you can improve the constraint solver and the, the, all the programs automatically benefit from the improvements to the constraint solver. So this is also 
uh, quite unusual that you can keep the program in this way and simply find the most elegant formulation and you benefit from all the improvements and in the constraints of and you know that this syntax this will always be there this will this predicate logic syntax this will always be like this uh, this is mm -hmm. very uh, timeless attraction i want to ask our students alexander Nostra, yeah. and laura and adrian do you have any question do you, do you have any whatever you 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 want to know we have a marcus Triska today Probably you are trying to resolve the exercises, Alexander, Laura? Well, no, I, I actually don't have a, a particular question. I was just curious uh, okay. because also you advertised it so good and said um, it would be very nice. So can you can yeah. you put your camera to see Marcus or to see that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's nice. Nice Thank to you. meet you. Thank Hi. you, Alexander, <laughs> Laura. Thank nice you. you. Yeah. Alexander and Laura are our Erasmus students. And this is a very, for me, it's a, like a, a most uh, challenging uh, teaching class because there are people that never program before. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so happy to see how a student without no previous um, knowledge in programming can resolve exercise like your Sudoku and can understand that in only uh, 12 lessons, more or less, um, two hours, yes. 24 hours. Um, they start from totally zero, no idea in programming, never programming mm -hmm. before, to understand your code in uh, the Sudoku, for example. Or yeah. So for me, it's like a so great challenge every year with these uh, Erasmus students. Um, this year I have many good people working with, uh, nice. with that. So happy. nice. Yeah, I'm very pleased to hear this. Um, uh, thank you also for for coming. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope you have uh, fun with this. Uh, I'm, yeah, I have also seen a lot of progress, uh, especially by by absolute beginners. Who, yeah, I mean, it takes. You can make. I mean, this is also a danger, certainly. I've also seen people very promising, very fast progress, uh, and then and then completely breaking down, completely collapsing, completely falling apart after maybe uh, three months or so. Um, so this is also a danger of, of overtraining, maybe one could say, or of, of going too, too quickly. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's... To, in my experience... And maybe six months of use or so. Uh, after six months, you can you can then start to truly to truly benefit from Prolog. In the first few weeks or months, you can make very fast progress. You can run. Uh, you can then uh, solve all these um, uh, also puzzles, interesting tasks, also timetabling and so on. But the true uh, benefit uh, will will usually take at least six months of, of dedicated work and after six months you then you can truly start with um, meta interpreters with uh, programs that analyze and run other prolog programs uh, and this is then where the true uh, benefit comes from and um, yeah so so and if you if you go too fast to to, to that stage uh, then I, I've seen all kinds of I have seen all kinds of strange phenomena uh, from beginners who were very promising at first uh, also on the internet I mean I, I know them I, I interacted with them they began to solve uh, quite advanced tasks answer quite advanced um, questions also very fast and then uh, collapsed uh, completely and, and then made the worst beginner problems and beginner errors again fell down to to the the, the lowest level parts of prologue and then staying there exclusively so this is Maybe it takes also some some uh, focus to really also also work in the in the in the right part of the language, so to say, in, in the part that that preserves these properties um, of logical reasoning and in this uh, pure monotonic part, it's called. Uh, and there you can apply these logical properties, and there you have the flexibility of, for example, interpreting the same program with different execution strategies. This only works if you if you retain these 
logical properties. And if you throw them away, if you ignore this, then you will not benefit from this. And then it becomes some some unorganized, um, some swamp uh, where you never uh, get out again. Mm -hmm. Will be interesting to know how many times we need one person from totally zero. Yeah. From zero to resolve Sudoku in I don't know, yes. in Python in Java or Java and Java or Python. Yeah. I don't know, probably yes. much more time. Yes, that's than, certainly or, I mean yeah. That's certainly so. So I mean, I know, I know. As a beginner, it, it can all seem very uh, tough, also, and some parts. Yeah. Or, uh, also, if you know, especially some other programming languages, then Polo can seem very hard. But the reason I think, in my in my opinion, at least, is that you start also with much harder tasks. So, for example, the the initial Java tasks maybe implement some uh, I I don't know work with some array or some linked list. This is not an issue at all. Apollo, you simply write it down and it's there. So you 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 start from a much harder uh, base level already, where you suddenly solve complex, often family relationships or, or co quite complex combinatorial tasks. No no Java beginner could solve any of this, and there, these are tasks that are not given also uh, to beginning um, uh, Java or Python students uh, never. So uh, Apollo, you start with tougher tasks. Uh, passing, for example, uh, already, and and then it, it can seem also harder, certainly, um, and and also yeah, to to it's hard also to keep students certainly to make sure also as a student that you are on track in that in that in the right direction, so to say, that you are really benefiting the most from Prolog by by staying to this to this monotonic core core language. Uh, and not get get lost in in the the parts that are maybe uh, there for for historical reasons or for for some yeah other other reasons. Okay. Uh, it's hard. Yeah, it's sorry. It just maybe to, to it is. It's tough also from a didactic perspective, certainly because your your. If you show these parts, then they are known, then they will be, be, uh, be more used. If you don't show them, then it looks like you don't have an opinion maybe on them. Uh, and then maybe someone finds it out from some book or then uh, then it seems like these are equally good. So it's a tough uh, balance also, uh, whether you even show these tasks or discuss them, these, these parts of the, of the language, or whether you simply leave it out entirely. It's uh, tough. I also uh, don't know which approach works best whether and or where this balance exactly is maybe maybe there should also be some uh sense of showing also what's how not to do it but it's a tough uh, didactic question okay thank you uh, adrian i want to ask you if you want to participate you have any question you have uh want to Okay, um, to don't make that uh, because I have, I don't know, 100 questions. I have, I want to do many questions about the Scribe problem, but I think um, um, we can have a meeting later. Uh, probably I, I want to know what is the future or what is the, mm -hmm. what your vision about Scribe Prologue. But I, uh, before that, and to not to, to do that so long, um, uh, last, uh, this week, one professor in my department um, talked about the white book in um, artificial intelligence in Europe. And, yes, uh, the white book, and, yes. Yeah, and he, he talked about the, what is the situation now in the world about artificial intelligence, like the news that United States and China yes. are ahead in Europe, Europe, Europe is saying the the back side of the research in artificial intelligence last time. Um, now it's like um, Europe want to react to this situation mm -hmm. and put a lot of effort to to improve to make the companies more um, more intelligent or using this type and for for my students or for the students uh, i want to know how this new um 
effort in Europe, in Europe can affect mm -hmm. to, to the one person that are shooting now and what what you recommend to mm -hmm. the student to they can do to be in this new era of artificial yes. intelligence in company you Europe probably putting a lot of money yes a lot of effort to to improve <laughs> how they and um, and the idea to apply artificial intelligence in all areas, in all aspects like agriculture, health, education, yes. and many, many things. What do you think? Because our students are from many different areas. Mm -hmm. um, what you can recommend um, yes. to, to do in this new era of artificial intelligence uh, related to Prologue, uh, mm -hmm. what to do? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I posted the link to the white paper on artificial intelligence in the chat. Um, it's um, uh, it's here. You can download it uh, if you're interested. So I mean, the maybe to to discuss it head on. I mean, the question is not uh, how can we uh, catch on now, but where. How, what can you do so that you are um, ready in where the others are moving? So you must be heading where, where the journey is going, not where uh, everyone is now, because otherwise you will always only uh, catch up. I mean, it's certainly an, a, a good political trick to, to go to the government and say, for example, oh, the other country is extremely far ahead. I need, I certainly need funding uh, for this project because we are falling behind. This was also applied in the 80s where the US researchers uh, went to their governments and said the Japanese, they are extremely ahead um, and uh, they are now uh, ev getting even further ahead. We need funding, certainly. And then, uh, yeah, they also got their funding. Um, so certainly it's also a political interest to, to state others are extremely far ahead. However, certainly some are ahead, but but in Europe, the situation is also, I mean, we have a very strong educational system in Europe, uh, strong universities where many of these ideas even or originated uh, and, and are taught. Uh, I mean, even I uh, studied computational intelligence, so it's not called artificial intelligence, but very heavily statistics, uh, logic based. Um, curriculum was perfectly normal and, and was a perfect continuation of what, uh, what was completely, uh, I mean, well understood also in, in Vienna because we had also in Austria, for example, uh, great researchers and also still have great researchers both in symbolic and in statistical approaches. So I think certainly you must have a, a well uh, founded base of um, the scientific. Um, landscape so you should certainly know what's what's the state of the art state of the the science uh, currently and 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 then i mean there are so many uh, issues to tackle where you can apply uh, if you know these technologies if you know for example programming languages that let you really reliably all and easily automate things this is in huge demand as we see it uh, currently almost everywhere during the pandemic, for example, um, even even basic questions like reliably ensuring these logistics, for example, that uh, everyone has a reliable date, where they get a vaccine, where they can register. These are all uh, rules also that must be applied so that uh, everything also must uh, happen according to, to technical standards also that can, so for example, that you can still fly to a different European country, show that you are, for example, vaccinated or that you uh, have been tested. Uh, so this this is a huge topic in Europe, especially to um, because we are dispersed across Europe with different languages, with different cultures. We must have technical standards to to meaningfully cooperate. And this is certainly also one important point of this white paper on artificial, on artificial intelligence that we have common standards, and this includes certainly standards for programming languages, um, so that we can. Uh, easily exchange solutions, easily interoperate. And uh, I think this will be an important uh, topic for, um, uh, for European uh, cooperation in this, in, in cyberspace, you could say. So uh, cross-country reliable networks based on 
nice standardized programming languages and uh, languages that allow to, to more quickly and more reliably build uh, the necessary IT solutions. You know, for example, um, a good place, a good master, because for example, our students are start at this point, they are a basic, basic knowledge about Prolog. Um, do you know a good place, a master in logic programming that um, prepared to someone that is not from the field of computer science or other fields mm -hmm. to be um, ready to apply artificial intelligence with logic programming techniques yes. to their areas in agriculture? I don't know. Alexander, for example, I, I don't remember now. What is your nationality, your studies? German, actually. German. And, and you did? Uh, I did a... I did a bachelor in economics and now I'm economics. doing a master in uh, business analytics. Okay, perfect business. And Laura? Um, I'm German as well and I did a bachelor in marketing research. Marketing now research. I'm doing business analytics as well. Okay, business. Business. Uh, but mm -hmm. they are a student for all the different fields. Like, you know, a place where if, if, they, if they want to they want to improve, um, mm -hmm. um, they can take, for example, in Austria or I don't know, in yeah. other place. Yeah, I post a link. I mean, uh, especially uh, German speaking uh, people are here at an advantage because there is this GUPU system by Ulrich Neumerkel. So this is my Prolog teacher. He runs um, a logic programming co course at TU Wien. And I, I send you the link, I paste the link in the chat. It's called uh, GUPO. So this is a Gesprächsunterstützende Programmierumgebung for the German-speaking participants. Uh, and this is a very advanced uh, automated teaching environment for Prolog. So the way this works is, and this is not available publicly, but available if you take this course. Um, this is uh, an automated system that interacts with the student by having internally a reference implementation of these examples and uh, then also making statements about the student code based on conclusions that are drawn from the reference implementation and also pinpointing, for example, and saying this should not hold, but currently it holds with your program. Um, so you must uh, specialize the program. Or for example, this doesn't hold, but should hold, you must generalize the program. So you learn to think in terms of specialization and generalization um, and this is all automated. So uh, this is one major attraction of the system that's in principle, it's, it's, it's scalable um, because it doesn't requ uh, require a, a single person. Uh, but currently it's mostly available in German. I mean, there are French and English editions, but the German is the currently um, most up to date and includes all the latest developments uh, also that are now available or becoming available in uh, Scryer, um, Sixos. But but this is one thing I highly recommend, um, and and we have a lot of great uh, Polo programmers in Austria due to this uh, system who all took this uh, specific course, and I, I highly recommend it. Includes also uh, for specific tasks from industry uh, like uh, CPU scheduling, uh, DNA folding examples, um, uh, grammars, all kinds of of interesting also or bridge building examples. Um, all taken from industrial applications. Yeah. And, and do you think it's, it's possible to follow this uh, course for people that have no previous knowledge in programming? Or yeah, yeah, very... certainly. yeah, certainly. Yeah, this is certainly, the, this is all documented. It comes with, so you, lo you have to log in remotely in the, into the system. Um, and it has uh, thousands of pages of documentation also that you're, uh, that's available. It has these automated explanations so you can truly interact with the system and you can always also internally there uh, send a message uh, to the instructor and have this personal um, response. Nice. This is, yeah. So this is one uh, for me. It's a huge motivation. I mean, uh, my uh, one of my primary motivations to work, for example, on Scryer Prolog and on free Prolog systems in general is to, to make a free Prolog system available um, that that can run this GUPO system. Mm -hmm. 
because it's currently it's built on Sixus Prolog. Um, and my goal is to help these uh, free implementations uh, with all the necessary features so that they can at one one day run Gupo. I remember now you told me last year that right to this professor to us to access this this system, but uh, this time I have no. I want to to be involved, and I'm thinking to make a stage probably um, go. I don't know if possible one or two mounts go there and try if it is possible. I don't know, and try mm -hmm. to learn this methodology would be nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, if I had the possibility to go, but now I have time. Yes. I have, I have six, seven months without classroom now. So nice. I, yeah, I have time to, to go. And yes. I, this is one of, of my ideas that to improve, to learn this um, nice methodology will be good. I will probably, I will ask you later about uh, this perfect. option probably yeah, to, to talk this yeah. this professor it, this would be awesome i mean this would be great yeah please anytime uh, if you are also in vienna please let me know and uh let's let's visit also ulrich who implements this system he's the convener of the prolog iso standardization group also he's a true uh expert um uh, one of the foremost experts um in the world about uh, prolog implementations yeah. And, and the only one who teaches it with this automated approach, which he himself uh, built. So this is, would be nice to see. Um, it would be great, certainly. I, ha I have the idea. I really have to explore the options, but I have the idea to go there for some weeks. Nice. Right this would be perfect. Please let us know. Um, what do you think is we finish uh, with, um, I, I don't know, if some, I, ha I have some, one question, if you want to finish, to not, not do this this conference so long um, about for example scribe scribe prologue what is the yes. point is is because now um, I had in my computer with with uh, docker mm -hmm. it's not easy now this moment to installing it's not easy like like s uh, double, double, w i prologue to install um, Prolog, um, the version of Pro we use now have this graphic um, debugger. Yes, and it's more easy. Um, what do you think about a Scry Pro? What is the the point now? Mm -hmm. um, how many times do you think um, is needed to have a version with all the I don't know the most important question ready or do you think it's now ready no no it's not yet i mean scryer prologue is one of the most interesting recent developments it started um a few years ago only it's now uh, one could say beginning um still because uh, this is now just a few years and uh, currently uh, for example has uh, no garbage collection so if you have a long running tasks that generates terms you will run off out of memory uh, in, in at some time so the system needs uh, for example a garbage collection so that you can run because the interesting programs run without ever terminating for example if you want to find a proof of something which you don't know or some counter example to con or some conjecture you start a program tr tries to find something and then keep it running for maybe years or decades as long as it takes so you need a garbage collector that reclaims the memory that's no longer needed uh, because these terms are no longer referenced so that's one thing um, and also mark tom the, the implement of scryer prolog uh, mark is now working on a on a more compact internal representation of terms so that it will also become much faster still so this is currently really beginning uh, it, it's quite nice already one can show some interesting things already it has some libraries like library debug but the the, the key attraction already now of scryer prolog is and this is the first prolog system that has it ever uh, is a very compact internal representation of strings. So a string is a list of characters, so one character atoms. And um, in normal in, in all other prolog systems or in other prolog systems before Scryprolog, now some other systems are also adopting these new techniques. But in all other systems, instead of, uh, for example, if you have an ASCII string, le let's say A, B, C, D, just four atoms maybe, uh, this is just 
for example, should be four bytes just. Uh, if you have ASCII, there should be four bytes in memory. But normal in Prolog, an uh, A, the atom A, is not just one byte, but takes eight bytes because it is one address into, into memory. And for an atom, it usually takes one so-called cell of memory. And the cell is not just one byte, but eight bytes. So each of these four bytes would, it is already an eightfold overhead. Uh, on 64-bit systems because one cell is uh, eight bytes on 64-bit systems. But not only that, but a list has a certain representation in Prolog uh, where you have uh, a functor, this is called a dot for a list, dot, then the first element of the list, and then the tail of the list. So you have already this, for this to store this dot, you have again eight bytes. So you have at least a 16-fold overhead and probably even more, even a 24-fold mm -hmm. overhead over the, the normal uh, representation one could use this, this just four bytes. And Scryer Prolog is the first system ever to implement these lists of characters so compactly. And this means that for the first time ever, you, we can use now Prolog for the task it was intended, namely fast parsing of huge amounts of text. And um, this is now unique. This is an, a very exciting development in Scryer Prolog. And now other Prolog systems are also already adopting this. And I hope that even more systems certainly provided in the, fu uh, in the future. And also the first system where characters are, are really now the default. So you can write the string as simply using double quotes. You have double quote A, B, C, D. And it's a list of characters, which is nice, certainly, because you can now easily write these uh, strings and have all conforming to the ISO standard uh, and have this very compact internal representation. And yeah, this also it's the first product system written in, in Rust, with, which is a new uh, systems programming and general purpose programming language with some very interesting uh, properties. And I think this will, will be also a huge um, reliability benefit to, um, to use these uh, guarantees that Rust provides regarding this memory memory safety um, and uh, yeah, this all a huge, um, a very promising approach. Um, Rust. Rust is uh, Rust. Uh, no, it's called Rust. Uh, it's called Rust. This uh, programming language, uh, and I post uh, just. For, uh, to make it clear what we're talking about is this link here to, to Scryer Prolog. So yeah, this is just starting and it currently uh, for Windows, you need this Docker file uh, because because there's some component that Scryer Prolog uses. Uh, it's called this terminal um, crate, um, which is not available available yet for Windows, but I hope will also become available in due time. It's also a quite recent development or with recent, I mean, it's just in the last maybe five or ten years or so, or not even that. So we ex can expect this to be developed for 20 years maybe, um, assuming and I hope, of course, that the author has uh, this interest to, to continue with this work. Um, but I invite you to contribute or take a look at the system or share it. Um, and I hope one, some of you may also take a look at it and, and also find something interesting, for example, to contribute or to try it out um would be nice would be great of course um i think my last my last question um your code needs a scryer or for example the the timetable mm -hmm. um the code only r run in a scryer it's not possible yes. to, to run in in s double w i uh, you can uh, you can run it, but it requires uh, certainly some changes. Um, so in in Scryer Prolog, I have made some recent improvements to the constraints over, over finite domains. Uh, for example, this chain uh, this chain predicate where I know now that uh, I initially used the wrong argument order. Uh, so the the first argument in chain should be the constraint because uh, so for example you can have uh, y uh, so chain should be uh, the the less y because then you can have for example really such a chain of chains uh, where you where you map list chain I posted here where you have uh, a list of chains. 
it's so not and, and if the argument if the argument is are, so you can easily you could add this but it's a compatibility compatibility layer but uh, certainly i try to promote uh, scribe product due to its uh, standards compliance so it really conforms or aims for conformance to the iso standard which is a big plus to exchange uh, prolog applications because then it now it's it's also not dependent on on this single system but you could for example switch another uh, iso conforming system uh, for example in sixus in sixus prolog it would run nice okay thank you so much thank, thank you. you so much marcus sergio laura alexander adrian Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. It was really interesting. <laughs> thank you. I yeah, yeah. to hear that. Yes, thank you for attending. It was a pleasure, thank and you. I hope you have fun and uh, interest. If you have, uh, yeah, any questions, maybe that uh, you remember later, to just let me know anytime. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you so much. You, you good. Have, <laughs> thanks, yeah. you have your email in your in your web page, you know. If yes, it's something in the web page like or in the programs, um, or please just ask Jose. Okay. It's great. Thank you so much, Marcus. I uh, really, I always, um, for me, it's like a big surprise. I write you some days ago, only so days ago. Um, after one year, I know you are a very busy pe person, <laughs> many <laughs> things to do. And you answered to me with um, this um, opportunity to have this video conference. And after that, I asked you for the option to to have with this my students, and I'm only have um, to give you thanks for 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 your for your time and your I don't know how to say disponibility. I don't know. I I don't find yeah. the, the Spanish thing. You're this very world. very <laughs> welcome. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for okay. me. I'm I'm glad and uh, really proud also to. Uh, uh, see that you're interested in this and I, I hope you'll continue to find it useful. So take care, everyone. Thank you a lot. Have a great evening. Yeah, the same. Same for you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello.